Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to this uh, session, which is uh, focusing on uh, uh, the award that uh, Informatics Europe uh, gets uh, every year. And the award is uh, the, uh, uh, for the award, a uh, committee has been appointed and the, uh, the chair of uh, the committee uh, was Steve Ferber uh, from the University of Manchester. Uh, and uh, we are very glad that uh, the award this year um, has been given uh, to uh, Valentina Daghiene and Wolfgang Paul in recognition of the outstanding educational initiative Bebra's International Contest on Informatics and Computer Fluency. Uh, let me uh, say a few words again on the award and then I will give the floor to the winners. So, uh, the award uh, uh, is uh, given to the field of informatics education in schools. Uh, I think that in the uh, uh, in, in the discussions we had yesterday, uh, it came uh, as a consideration from uh, uh, many people, uh, you know, it became evident that we all believe that if a change has to occur, uh, is a change that has to start from the young generations. So computational thinking, making, you know, the principles uh, that are behind uh, uh, computational thinking, uh, part of uh, uh, the culture, uh, uh, requires an effort that has to start uh, from uh, the very beginning in the education. Uh, we strongly believe that this is the way to go. We have tried, you know, uh, you know, in, with many uh, initiatives uh, to uh, uh, endorse this idea and in practice. And the award is exactly a sign of this recognition. The second uh, comment that I want to make is that uh, we are able uh, to give this award uh, thanks to the generous support uh, that is given to us uh, by Microsoft. Uh, and so this is also a recognition for our sponsor uh, through uh, which we can support this very important initiative. So what uh, uh, is going to happen now is that, well, I thought there was an, another slide. Anyway, so the, the, there will be a talk uh, by the, uh, um, uh, the winners of the award, uh, and there will be a presentation uh, from uh, the sponsor of the uh, uh, award. Before uh, we uh, uh, do the, uh, the talk, though, I'm very happy to uh, uh, present the award, and I would like uh, the sponsor to join me in uh, giving the award to the winners. So please, you know, join me. So th thank you very much. My name is Wolfgang Pohl. I'm from Germany. Uh, I'm affiliated a slight little bit with the University of Bonn, so I'm not completely wrong here. Uh, but I'm in, in general, my job is to, to manage computer science contests in Germany for high school students. So what is informatics at school about? And what, is, what has been the history of that? Very shortly. 
about 1980, and this is very early, only very short time after having informatics computer science at universities at all, very shortly after that, informatics came to schools. And it began with something, they talked about hardware, they talked about algorithms, these were the main, main points, main issues in the first years. And in the coming 20 years, many changes happened to what about informatics or computing was taught in schools. And uh, about the year, around the year 2000, we had that using computers was taught in schools, but was often mislabeled as informatics. Informatics education, genuine informatics education happened, if any, in the last years of school only. And so the problem was that somehow the sometimes the wrong students were attracted to the subject. Yeah, so if you get a kind of wrong impression in the first years of school, then you think, oh, it's just about using computers, I'll, I'll continue with these courses in the end of school, and then comes real informatics stuff and you fail, it's not good. And the other way, the kids that were good or could be good, were interested, said, well, that's a boring subject, it's only about using computers, and they don't take the course. And so this was really kind of wrong. So, Tools were needed to improve and clarify the image of informatics. To promote informatics, or computational thinking as a more general term. To increase the visibility of real informatics at school, and of the subject at all. And then, in, in the end, kind of to attract the right students again. So, the idea was to use a contest as an educational tool. A contest, or as we call it now, a challenge, may motivate students, inspire teachers, and if it's a contest with given tasks, sets standards. So if a good contest is well known, teachers, students will look at the tasks of this contest and see, okay, that seems to be, that must be informatics. Yeah, that's defining the subject. And the inspiration was the mathematical kangaroo that perhaps some of you know as well, which had a huge success with millions of participants. And Valentina de Giene said in the early 2000s, well, we have, to need, we have to do something similar. And she founded Bebras. And we wanted to do it right for informatics from the beginning. We didn't want to require prior knowledge of informatics in the tasks because we know that only a few students have informatics education as well in school. So we wanted to focus on the thinking aspects that everyone should be capable of. We wanted to do it digitally from the beginning, so with online implementation of the contest. And we wanted to stress after the contest that the tasks are really about informatics. So to get an impression of the tasks, I've prepared a few slides with them, but I try to go into this interactively. So where is it? Okay. There's a contest, a small Bebras contest. That's cool. A little bit of that is in German, I'm sorry, because it's in the German system. But let's go to the task directly. It's a little bit smallish. Here, there's uh, the Lifo ice cream parlor. Have you ever seen in your, in your city? At Da Lifos, yeah, the new ice cream parlor? Okay, I'll try to find it. In the Leaf 4 ice cream parlor, there's the scoops of ice cream are stacked on your cone in the exact order in which you ask for them. You can imagine, the ice cream guys, you ask strawberry, get strawberry, and so on, right? So what do you have to say in order to get the ice cream shown in the picture with first strawberry, then the fantastic blue Smurf ice cream, it's really awful, and then chocolate. So what, what, do, you want, what do you need to say? So any, any volunteer who can answer the question correctly? Strawberry, Smurf, and chocolate. Well, let's click that. Okay, so no immediate feedback. Let's see at the end how it goes. All right. The next one. Okay, there are two boats, and you can fill, put barrels onto the boat. And the barrels have a weight of kilo, in kilograms, and each boat can handle a maximum of 300 kilograms only. And so now move the barrels onto the boats. You want to load, you want to carry as much weight as possible within the limit of 300 kilograms per boat. So any suggestions for that? We could start with a 220, sounds good, right? 
Is 220, is that okay? Any objections to 220? Someone there in the, beh in the behind? Yes? can't add anything to the 220, well, you can get up to 280, but you can't reach the That's not really good, right? Yeah, 220 is perhaps not the right thing to go for. So no greedy approach here, please. Okay. Any suggestions? I start with then. I start with the next one. Maybe this is good. Any other? Th the next one? 120 and 1990, I'll take the other one. That fills the boat, right. And then I try how far I can go here, yeah. Okay, looks good. Don't forget to save the answer, yeah. Okay. Oh, this is fun, this kind of a game. So there's a... In the castle, there are these yellow rooms. A monster is hiding in the rooms. Catch the monster! You can click anywhere, and then you get shown rooms are still yellow and other are gray. And in the yellow ones, the monster can still be present there. So now you click and catch and hunt it. So, but where to click? We, we try to use as few clicks as possible for this, yeah, for this hunt. So for example, when I go, oh, I can go here. Oh, but the monster is not nice to me because it, ha it uses the other part that's larger, unfortunately. So perhaps this is not the right way to go. So what would you, what would you suggest? The middle one. And let's continue with that strategy. Ah, here, it goes to the right. Caught. Six clicks. Let's save that. Okay, we're done with the contest. Let's see how we did. It's full score. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for helping. <laughs> Very good. Okay, then we can... Valentina will continue with something about the history of all that. So now about, now about history, a little look what what was done before. So in 2004 was, uh, uh, as, as Wolfgang already mentioned, by the way, I'm from Lithuania, from Lithuania, Vilnius University, I'm professor at Vilnius University. And uh, so I'm working also with, uh, with uh, some talented, we're searching talented kids for Olympiads in informatics. And uh, one of uh, our idea was how to attract, uh, how to find these talents if, in order to find them when they are 15, 14 years old, you need to, to, to get access to them earlier. And in 2004, so uh, I thought that it's uh, quite good to have some small tasks for school students that they can solve them. I was very good um, as in, in this year. I did the uh, Baltic Olympiad in informatics, so we had uh, uh, 11 countries participated, and uh, so we talked with uh, friends, with uh, Wolfgang and other friends from Olympiads, and uh, so we decided to to, make, to establish this contest. At this time, we call only a contest on informatics and uh, computer computer fluency, it was a little slightly different name. And uh, so here you see this, uh, that how country is joining little by little. And uh, uh, last year, in 2014, we already had this 30, 35 countries. And uh, this year, we already have requests from more, more than nine countries, actually. But we will see, because contest will be soon in the uh, second week of November. Uh, so you see, the year is growing. Our co -co participants joining more and more, and uh, here is by numbers. No, uh, France and, and uh, Germany is <laughs> with the, with the uh, most uh, participants. It's a lot of participants, but we have also some, for example, like Estonia. Uh, uh, Estonia, where is Estonia? Estonia is uh, in, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. Estonia, and if we can, if we comp made a relation with the population, so Estonia will be on the top. So this is because they have only one around one million uh, part, uh, uh, inhabitants. 
So, and uh, what we are doing also be beyond this contest, beyond uh, participation, we produce in Babra's booklets, and the Germany is very successful all every year producing this. In, and all all these booklets are uh, free; you can download from a PDF from a website. Each country has own website. We have this um, international website Babras.org, and uh, is, here is all all um, countries that you can access from this website to each country and of course each country has own language uh, here is, uh, I can send this booklet this is in Lithuanian language and you can see just take a look so and what is what is very important that we explain for each task for each task we explain why it is informatics because it's as you, as you saw tasks are not very uh, visible that it is informatics just for teachers also and uh, we want it also to go behind what is what is important which concepts are important you can uh, when you saw when you see this uh, brochure you will see on the gray um, you will it's in for in 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 language Informatica, it's easy to understand that it is informatics. So we explain at least a little uh, what what concepts and here is about um, this task that you remember loading loading lizards and uh, here is why it is informatics. This is also in relation to computational thinking, is the composition, evaluation, and also we can talk about algorithms. Yes, that greedy algorithm doesn't work and so on. So. Also, we, for example, we have uh, many activities uh, in countries. Uh, actually, we do not know very well what countries are doing uh, because they, for example, like o Austria, have a very nice Bebras app that you can download and uh, and uh, solve tasks. Uh, some uh, educational materials on Bebras tasks, Switzerland doing. Russia has special issue of journal with uh, with uh, with tasks and, and uh, quite. Good Good resources for teachers. Uh, also, some countries put tasks in school textbooks and uh, and use even in uh, college level to teach uh, to teach informatics or introduce informatics. So, now you should finish. Thank you. So the question is: Do have do we have the mission accomplished with Bebras? The one, the goals that we had. I think yes. So ideas of informatics, concepts of informatics, of computational thinking are being presented to a very wide audience. You have almost a million contestants in the world by now, 850,000 roughly in Europe of them, from them, um, and numbers are still growing. In some countries it's really huge, in some other countries it could still grow. We are reaching girls there. In, we have an, a female participation of up to 50% in some countries, in some age groups. It, some, it depends on the age group still. We're reaching teachers. We're even, even reaching the general public. So my, my, my uh, favorite example is that uh, I heard that uh, two, um, uh, two women in, in, the, in the forum of an educational magazine, so that the online forum of an educational magazine, were kind of chatting to each other, oh, how did your son uh, uh, do in, in the beaver this year? Yeah? This was really, this is in, then really, it's, it's in the general, general public, yeah? it's awareness. And when I visited a friend recently, the son of her said, yeah, yeah, I did the informatic Bieber, I did the Bebras in Germany. And I said, yes, I'm the boss of that. Wow, he said, cool, I know the boss of Bebras. Yeah, and then and he was really, really loved it. And um, so, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming kind of a star in Germany. Yeah, sure. <laughs> We increase the visibility of informatics at school. And if you look for, let's for example, the German uh, Informatik Bieber in Google, you get many, many entries. Uh, like, like, let's say, okay. Um, many, many school websites. They're actively talking about their participation. And here's, interestingly, the German school, school in Shanghai. Yeah? <laughs> so we have some, the, also the German schools everywhere in the world are participating. Uh, it's just telling about, oh yeah, we had 266 uh, participants in the Beaver this year, and numbers are growing. We have talents detected. We know that teachers are using Beaver as a 
uh, kind of from promotion for their for their courses. When when you have uh, the advanced courses uh, where you can choose if if you if you take them or not, you be promote be, uh, them with with Beaver before. And so we get the right students, the, the the kids that are successful in the Beaver. They have a talent in computational thinking. And so if they choose informatics, that's the right thing. Um, we have a vivid community of Bebras organizers. It's now 35 countries and it's growing. And it's all over the world and this is a really interesting community. New ideas all the time. And within this community also educational research has been stimulated a lot. Many publications related to Bebras by members of the community. And there are many international research corporations as well in this community. So, I think the success of Bebras is that it conveys the message informatics is fun. And you see some pictures of kids doing Bebras and, and really uh, sometimes, well, thinking hard, explaining to each other, really wondering about the solution. Uh, uh, and uh, you see girls and boys and you see older kids and, and younger kids all together. And um, perhaps a, a small remark, there's an unofficial remark, no slide about this. What's the relationship to universities? Because you are from universities. Many universities are supporting Bebras, many Bebras organizers are coming from universities, but there are still many countries, they're still struggling about getting things going. Yeah? Volunteers that really try to, do, try to get things going, but have difficulties uh, just of manpower and resources. So if you would like to get hooked up with the Beaver in your country, you can, I think, contact us or look at Bebras.org and find the national organizers, get in touch with them. In some countries, for example, the Netherlands do a second round, and this is hosted at the universities. Maybe one of Dutch representatives is here, I know. Um, so it's a good idea. Look for the beaver, and you get, and you get the talents. So thank you for awarding us. These are all the beavers of many, many countries. There are still more, and hopefully still more to come. Thank you so much. I found this a fantastic experience, and I'm sure that most of you uh, felt the same. So I wonder if uh, there's any further questions, or you're just there. Ha! <laughs> Moshe. <laughs> so, if, if the goal is m more more visibility for for Bebras, it's a, it's a smashing success. But somehow it feels to me there should be more, right? There should be other, other measurable consequences for this. So let's compare it. Facebook, you know, they say we are now, we have a billion subscribers. But what matters to them is because of that, they can charge more on advertising, for example. That's how, that's the concrete. The concrete goal is make more money in advertising. It has to be some to me, some measure, of, some outcome that you would like to see and measure more than just that this activity itself is, becomes very visible. What is it? Uh, that's, that's a good question, of course. Um, I think so far we can just count, count the participation and we can just estimate that behind each participant there is a, probably a family talking about this. Yeah, we, we know from talks that we have sometimes parents calling us on the phone yeah, and say, oh, why, 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 does this task, uh, why does this task not work on my tablet computer? And I see that, that, that the father is, kind of, father is kind of solving the contest, not the kid. Yeah, right? um, so there's families around them. And of course, there are many press releases in the, national, uh, in, in, in the regional press when there's a winner of the school. There's the school websites. Um, we do not have yet a real measurement beyond counting participants. I think it's, the problem is this, this is an international project by many, many organizers in the nations and everyone is working kind, kind of differently a little bit. And, and um, so it's hard, um, it's hard to say that. Maybe Valentina has an, yeah. 
Uh, I would like uh, to add a little because about these publications that we, uh, we uh, countries started to do research and publications or con uh, related to Bebra's tasks because it's, it's uh, not easy to do with all countries, especially when we are not a big organization with funding or so we are all, all almost all volunteers and but already we have around 100 research papers published in different uh, journals and it's uh, uh, also pro Bebra org you can find is this in different languages Czech I know the Czech Slovakia very successful published several papers we wrote also with Gerald Fuchev professor Gerald Fuchev from the uh, university we wrote also several several papers and we for example we are trying to investigate like like uh, uh, cognitive thinking of kids when they are for example uh, we can re we can record because our this management systems can record uh, how how kids uh, behave when they are making interactive tasks and uh, how they choose answers so we have this uh, thousands of uh, uh, data records uh, of course we should work more with this but this is uh, for future that we can make research and especially cultural cultural aspects also with when we, with, uh, we compare some data with Taiwan and, and Japan is quite different the understanding of tasks or behavior of kids uh, it's many, many questions but we are starting to do this uh, can I maybe follow up on this asking just one thing do you have any perception of the influence of this on teachers I mean is this uh, a way also to uh, improve uh, the uh, knowledge at, for teachers, involve them more in doing this, or, I mean, what is the... Uh... Okay. Well, we definitely get, get much feedback. There is no, no, um, no formal analysis of this so far, but we get much feedback. The teachers like the tasks, and now finally someone is kind of telling us and telling the kids what informatics is all about, and they're using the task not only within the contest, but they're using it in their, um, in their lessons, sometimes for tests, sometimes kind of linked to topics of, of the standard curriculum um, as, a, as an entry into, into, uh, after, and, and going into detail after, after the Bebra's task. So I think the kind of, of standards with teachers is rising through that we are kind of developing these tasks on an international level. We have a high standard of the ta on the task quality. I you know, try really to make very good and very well formulated tasks so they're really useful and usable and the teachers use it. Yeah, that's I think the big effect of that. In, in Lithuania, we noticed that, for example, like uh, when teachers wanted to introduce some concepts, they, they can use tasks, for example, like graph. If you started with graph theory, it's very hard to motivate students. But when you start this collection of uh, six, seven, ten tasks, uh, inter interesting, funny tasks, then students motivate and then they choose the course. Coming. Thank you. I would like to ask something concerning the danger of this, because um, I see my students at the first year of university, and they, for the most part, have a lot of experience in games, and so they come and they hope that they will do games, and they are very good in this kind of tasks, but the problem is that, that when they face discrete mathematics and the theory of algorithms and everything that is so hard, they generally uh, don't, sometimes don't want to dip this. So the problem is not only computational thinking, but also, in my opinion, I'm not a mathematician, but also mathematical thinking. Um, yeah, probably yes, I remember my studies as well, so math is hard, <laughs> that's good, uh, yes, but, but well, there are math contests all around, so, uh, but I think the focus of Bibras is clearly um, on, on, on informatics theory behind that, with every single task can show that there is about data structures, uh, there's about algorithmic aspects, that's about mingling, mingling data together, and, and, and it's, I think, the guys that are really good at this can be good at informatics. And my assumption, my assumption is that usually they will also be good in mathematics. I know many examples. We have not investigated that so far. But I think I have a, if you're good in Bibras, you should think about doing further informatics at school. 
And if it's this, le this le lesson, this, this education is good at school, then you are prepared. Thank you. Oh, hello. Yes, yes, I'm coming. Um, okay, en Enrico Nardelli, University of Roma Tor Vergata, wonderful job um, that you have been doing in the last 10 years. I would like to have some more information about uh, how things are orga organized. So the context is uh, held at the same time in all countries or each country organized by themselves and also is divided by age of students. Uh, a little bit about this. Yes, sure. Uh, so, yeah, we aim to have it at the, at the same time in all over the world. It doesn't work out completely because of the hemispheres and different school years. And the point is, in contrast to the math kangaroo who does everything on a one day in all, all over the world, we want really to have as, as little restrictions as possible, so make it, make it as good as possible for every country, so that as many kids as possible can participate. So, not many limits. We try to have the Beaver, Beaver Week, the Bebras Week in November. Most of the countries do it at this time, but not, not everyone. And then, of course, the tasks are divided by age. So, they are set appropriate to age groups. And, uh, uh, for example, in Germany, we are starting with uh, uh, grade 5 in secondary school, about 10 years old. Some countries are already starting in primary school with uh, 7, 8 year olds, uh, and then going until the end of the school uh, career. Uh, and so, we have five, four or five age groups, uh, and I think in the United Kingdom, even, even six. So, and, and there's also liberty for the countries to, to find the best way in their country, because all the school systems are different, right? It's, it, it's, it's a plague, yeah, it's a plague. All the school systems are different, and in Germany we have even 16 different school systems within Germany, and, and in Switzerland it's even worse, uh, and so that's horrible. But, but, but yeah, try to adapt it as, as good as possible, you know, organizationally, and it's online, and you have to you usually have to have your login, and then your, yeah, and things like this. Fantastic initiative. I, I think that quite clearly competitions are the way to motivate um, students, especially at a young age. Uh, so I'd, I actually have two questions. The one is, you might have covered it, but I'm not sure. When uh, a student solves a problem, are they aware then or maybe later of the kind of problem they've solved? You mentioned things like greedy algorithm or so on. Are those words revealed to them? Or is it just, oh, I solved another problem? <laughs> yeah, maybe I will start and then Wolfgang, because we, uh, like from different countries also, we have like different aspects. So when in Lithuania or in, uh, as I know, in some other also countries, we have immediately feedback to students about that they can get solution and also we encourage them to discuss. We have in, because we have, during, uh, in Bebra's community, we have maybe about 10 different management systems. So, for example, with Germany, we are using different different systems. We have our own uh, system and it depends of course of, of the system what, uh, what um allowed so we uh, we encourage and uh, we notice that after this uh, uh, day uh, uh, when students participate after they have many questions and uh, uh, they answered for each other discuss tasks and teachers also involved and organizers so it's it's going some some uh, on, on this discussion level after after contest we are doing workshops I know that uh, some countries Russia especially they're doing many workshops uh, with teachers the teachers asking and teachers wanted to to know what material behind how to teach how to improve or how to choose for next next year or some maybe yeah so we are mainly at, at this time I think the booklets is the most important thing and if the teachers are using this they can there's the it's informatics part and they can explain these things to the kids we are working on having uh, also the its informatics part implemented in the contest system itself. So there's a kind of revision mode where you come after the contest and we see the task again, see if your solution was right, you can try other solutions if you were wrong and, and see, uh, and, and we want to implement in this revision mode also the its informatics part, still to be done, but that's important, I think. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I, I'm the Dean of uh, Informatics at Schools at uh, Technical University in, in Barcelona. And I, I would like to add an, an important issue of, of this contest. I discovered this contest in France in a meeting of uh, the Society of uh, Teachers on Informatics or something like that. 
and uh, I decided that it's really a very a very nice experience and, and, and I was thinking why in Spain we don't participate in this. Uh, last year the, I think that the award was for the people from uh, from the UK and, and in the newsletter they also mentioned the contest and, and there was a small, a small line saying Spain uh, 800 students or things like that and I thought where? Who is dealing with this in, in Spain? So finally, we found that uh, we found that the people uh, who was dealing with this in a small uh, situation was in Bilbao. And now we made the contact with these people, and uh, using our contacts from the school, from from uh, from the university, we have a contact with a lot of uh, secondary schools. In try to trying to do things together. Uh, now we engage, uh, and, and we, I think we will have around 20 schools from Catalonia participating next uh, November in this contest. And I think that uh, the feeling is that, uh, from the university point of view, what uh, what we are uh, earning with this contest is more contact with the uh, primary and secondary schools. So this is really a very good impact, especially because it's in primary school, because Kanguru is not for uh, primary schools. So Kanguru is just, at least as uh, in, in, in Spain, uh, I think it's just from 14 to 18. So this is a, a very good experience, and I'm, I'm very happy that the, the award has been for this uh, initiative. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Just some more technical information. Do you have the same test all over the world? Do you translate this chart languages? And do you have any problem with the test taken at the same time in different areas than pub and problems like this? Yeah, it's the easiest part that we, tra of course, we translated all tasks for to each own languages because it's a primary school and uh, so, so we have uh, many languages and we are talking how to improve this uh, translation, maybe more visible or so. And it's, uh, it's, it's really, sometimes it's not easy to translate because tasks should be short and uh, pictures should be translated, somehow adopted, localized to culture or so. Uh, second is about, uh, do we choose? Uh, actually, we have workshop every, every year, uh, started from 2005. We have workshops that we meet together f uh, at least two, two, two uh, representatives from each country and uh, uh, we discussed, discussed very hard discussions from morning till uh, night and uh, we, <laughs> and we um, made this we call Bebra's task pool. It means that we have tasks around 200 or less but it's for all age, for all age groups and it means that each country can choose. Uh, we had some like um, what is it called, recommended tasks or uh, uh, some cat categorizations that, uh, that countries can see e e easier what, what, what they can choose, but it's up to countries. But I could say, for example, that some countries were using the same uh, task pool, m several years, Lithuania were using the same, like Germany, Austria, you have this block, Netherlands, uh, Switzerland, we are doing totally the same tasks. And uh, other countries countries also so make, but it's not, not compulsory to, uh, it's, it's almost compulsory to use from this pool of tasks, but they are allowed some modifications as well. Okay, I think, uh, you know, the discussion has shown the excitement, you know, about this uh, 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 work. Uh, so thanks very much again. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that there will be some enthusiastic feedback being brought back to our own places from this presentation. Thanks very much, Carlo. And once again, congratulations to the winners of the prize. I mean, that's really fantastic. I, I didn't know about uh, Brebras. I assume it means beaver. And um, I, I will certainly mention it widely when I get back to the United States where I live. Now, those of you who don't know me know, uh, might not know that I've been working for six years now at Microsoft Research in their outre outreach section. And we have a, a mandate to talk to universities about some of the great things our um, researchers do. 
And this year, one of the initiatives that we have is to talk about openness. And so that's what I'm going to do, is tell you a little bit about it. Fundamentally, openness, and not just open source, has very many flavors. You might already know that Microsoft Research as an organization is very open. Our researchers go to conferences, they present papers, we have interns, people come to visit. It's one of the most open labs there is. Uh, but we haven't up until now actually allowed any of the work that has done, been done in Microsoft research to go out into the community. And that has suddenly changed. In between all of that, over the past six years since I arrived, I have tried to make a little bit of a change um, because we had some requests from industry, uh, sorry, from academia, that it was very difficult to use the Microsoft uh, research products if they only worked on one platform, which was Windows at the time. And so what we did was various stratagems, which were to enable the systems that we had to run, for example, inside browsers. Now that was enormously successful because every um, computer, Macs, all of those had browsers. And we could put our small tools inside browsers and those, um, those systems still exist today and it's a fantastic way to get up and try what the researchers are trying to get out there and show to academics what they do. Uh, that system, by the way, is called Rise for Fun. There's a little card outside you can take it. Rise means research in software engineering. So Rise for Fun is go and have fun with all of these different tools. You can even add your own tool to Rise for Fun as a platform. Uh, touch develop is another one which I won't talk about. And then there is uh, virtual machines in the cloud. Now the cloud is just this amazing thing that we all know about and it has enabled uh, lots of cross-platform software to exist. Uh, Microsoft is not the only one who does this, but I have a funny feeling that we're doing it the best at the moment. The number of virtual machines, as I'll show you, that are out there is just so easy and there are so many of them. But what I really want to tell you is about this open source software. Now, I come from an era of uh, academics because I was an academic before I went to Microsoft where um, actually we didn't have open source software when I started. You know, it, it came from Sun or it came from other places, IBM initially, and then it came from Microsoft. And then finally there was this open source and we looked at it rather strangely, but all our sysadmins said that it was fantastic and you had to get it. And I went back to the literature just recently to try and find out why. Why is open source so good? Why do people rave about it? Of course, the reasons why they don't rave about it, and those would be people who come from Daimler or Mercedes and so on, and they've got to be very careful about what they put in their cars, and maybe open source wouldn't be the greatest thing. But if you're an academic, it really is a good thing to do. Popularity is one. If everybody else is doing it, do it as well, because then you can share textbooks and so on, and all the other good illities that are there of course, the last one is the one that people home in on, which is cost. But one shouldn't forget the others. It's not that open source is free and that's it. There are all these other good things that come with it. Security is an interesting one. Why would open source be more secure? Well, it's more secure because you can actually go in there and check it out. You can audit what is there. And I'll show you one of the, one of the um, tools that we have, which you wouldn't even think would be open source, but is. So when you get your open source, you can do fantastic things with it, as I'm sure many of you are already doing. There is a perceived value that is there with the younger generation, that if it's open source, it's better. And so that is something you can do. And 
often it is provided cross-platform as well. It's used in projects and we can use it in your research. So you will all have got this little flyer in your bags. If you haven't looked in your bags, look in it. And on the back there, you will find that there are a list of all the projects that are currently from Microsoft Research. In fact, since I produced the flyer, we've added another 11 of them. And the one I was going to tell you about security, you might know about the uh, TPM chip that is in many um, laptops. So that is the thing that does BitLocker and so on. That comes, uh, the software for running that comes from Microsoft. It's open source, right? Because it's all based on um, the uh, keys. And so it doesn't matter how the algorithm works because the keys are what's going to make it secure at the end of the day. So you can go in and look at the software for it. On the right hand side there is just something that was uh, last week from Carnegie Mellon where some students did an open source tools at Bang in Bangalore for sign language. You could just do amazing things if you start from a higher base. So Microsoft has a lot of open source. Inside the company we are now using it. Um, some of our really old software like .NET, which many of you remember from 15 years ago maybe, and is still the basis of Windows, um, Visual Studio and so on, is now open source, .NET itself is. And a lot of the packages around that, so you can go in and find those. That means that you can do really industrial strength um, projects using that. It's all up there on GitHub. And the links are there for you to go and look. And um, through Azure, all of these uh, popular packages here, and many, many, many more, are available. Just at the click of a finger, you can run them. But now what I've done, so personally, is, as part of my project, is I discovered that it's just a C. If you've got all these open source projects, it's like, like just sand out there. You can't make sense of it. They've got all these names and you actually don't understand what's going on. It's just too much. So I've categorized what's going on there. And if you go to my portal, which is researchmicrosoft.com open source, then from there you get these categories of uh, projects, cryptography, hardware, society, artificial intelligence, and so on. And from those, you get a list of the tools that are relevant for those particular um, topics. So that's what the website looks like. Um, if you've got your laptop open and you try to go to it, you'll probably find it's down. And that's because it's, um, it's about two o'clock in the morning today, and they're doing maintenance, which was just the worst time for me for them to do maintenance right now. But uh, in an hour or three, maybe it will be up again. And each of those projects comes with two very important things, not just the open source, which is on GitHub or CodePlex or somewhere. It also comes with access to the real person access to the researcher behind the project who will be prepared to talk to you, who will be prepared to talk to your students, who in fact wants to talk to your students because the reason they've open sourced the software is they want to grow their project a little bit using um, the, the fantastic uh, community that's out there. And these are just two of the ones from Cambridge on the right hand side there. This is um, Antonio Cremonisi's book and his work on decision forests. And on the left is a, another one. So that's really all I wanted to say. Um, I wanted to say that Microsoft has got this open source software take the message out and I'm going to distribute here for you because I'd like you to make sure that it does get into your departments these posters that you might not have seen on the table. You can take anything else from the table as well. But these are very nice posters um, that you can put on your 
on your um, notice boards back home. Thank you. Thanks, Judith. Uh, is there any uh, uh, questions on, on this? Yes? Microsoft uh, used to think of uh, open source software years back as something akin to Stalinism or something like that. So what, what do you, what in your opinion has caused the change in perception inside Microsoft? Well, it was really that um, we had to move with the times and it was a change of the chief executive officer. I think uh, Steve Ballmer, who was our previous um, chief executive officer definitely did not like open source but many people inside the company were starting to use it and so there had to be a way around that but Satya Nadella who is the new open source thing has publicly said and has said to all of the employees Microsoft embraces open source so we use it we create it and we advertise it can I follow up with this? So this means that future products will be yep. open source? Yes, yes. Um, not all of them, because otherwise I'd be out of a job because I wouldn't have anything to pay my salary. But, <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, certainly there are, there are definite projects that will be. And inside Microsoft Research, the process now for open sourcing is really easy. For interns, if your students go for interns at Microsoft Research, it's also very easy. It means they can go back to your university with the software in their pockets via GitHub, and it will be there ready to continue the project when they're home. Uh, so I, I also very much welcome you know, this, uh, this new uh, approach by Microsoft. Uh, open source is a very broad term, so could you say something about the licensing that would be uh, typically applied by Microsoft to open source because there's a broad variety there. Yeah, there, are a, there is a broad variety of licenses and quite honestly, I wouldn't like to right now uh, say which they are, but the ones that we are more in, in, in favor of is the one where you can include it in your, uh, in your software and then also resell it. So it's, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's trying to be as unrestricted as possible. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, if not, Great. thanks very much for the good news. Thank you. <laughs>